Our text this afternoon is found in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Please give your attention now to the holy and inspired word of the Lord. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. May God bless the reading of this holy word. Let us pray. Our Father, we have heard your word, we have heard your voice to us now in the book of James, and we ask as we hear the preaching of the word that you would bless it to our hearings. Father, we have read this passage many, many times, and uh, we seem to forget it as many times as we have read it. We pray that your spirit would now break the hold of sin in our hearts, and that we would receive this word with gladness, and that we would be convicted and encouraged and give glory to you in it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before you is one of the most important passages of all of Scripture. And I don't say that lightly. It truly is important. Child of God, if you meditate on this passage and remember it in your time of need, you would be more diligent in fleeing temptation. You would be mortifying sin and the remnant of your sinful estate. You would be growing in holiness And you would be more successful in escaping the snares set by the evil one. In addition, this passage contains within it a promised blessing of the hope of eternal life for those who do persevere through temptation. It also teaches us of God's character and the way in which he does test us. Frighteningly, most of all, it paints a picture of sin so gruesome that it should lead us away from the path that leads us to spiritual death. Because if Romans 8 has the golden chain that leads to salvation, James 1.15 is its deadly opposite. This is the deadly path towards damnation, that chain that leads to death. In today's Reformed Church, we tend to be too clinical in our understanding of sin and the scripture as a whole. But our forefathers in the faith, those Puritans, were not this way at all. They could paint for you a graphic picture of the horror that is sin. The very kind of picture that the Bible teaches, uh, that picture of that vicious animal that crouches at the door, ready to devour you, to get its fangs in you, to destroy you, to viscerate you. That is the picture that the Bible paints of sin. Sin is your deadly foe and you must master it is the commandment of God. And so we, the spiritual descendants of those Puritans, we also need to be filled with the horror of of our indwelling sin, and remember what John Owen said, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Owen, you see, understood the horror of sin and knew it was an enemy too deadly, too ferocious, too awful to make peace with. The only option for the Christian is to crush the head of sin, even as Christ crushed the head of that serpent. Our confession, when speaking of sanctification in chapter 13, calls the struggle between our indwelling sin and the new man, this, listen to this carefully, a continual and irreconcilable war. Calls it a war. Do you appreciate that language? Do you appreciate that language of sin? See, our forefathers understood quite well what we are up against. Use language like this when we talk about our relationship to sin. Use language like this. Our fight is much closer to home than you might think. There is an enemy within us that is seeking to consume us, but we are often at peace with this enemy. In the 6th century BC, Sun Tzu wrote in The Art of War. He wrote about going into battle. Know your enemy and know yourself, and you can fight a thousand battles without disaster. The problem with us as believers is that we often do not know we are in a battle or we don't admit it to ourselves. We don't act. We certainly don't act that way. We are not prepared for spiritual warfare, and yet this war goes on all around us and in us. Each day, 
Each and every day, there's a battle being fought for your soul, child of God. There's a battle being fought for your soul and for the kingdom of God itself. You are a participant. And the question is, are you prepared? Do you have training for this war? Are you ready? We succumb to spiritual laziness and our walk in the Lord is set back in defeat by these three great enemies of our soul. Sin, the devil, and the world. That great triumvirate that will try to assault you each and every day. But God in his goodness has given us the word of God. In Ephesians 6, Paul tells us to always be clothed in battle garb for the battle that rages. And the weapon given to us, of course, is that sword of the spirit, the word of God itself. But if we are honest to ourselves, we are very clumsy with this weapon. Many of us stumble with the word like that young boy who wields a sword without skill, falling on our own weapon, doing damage to ourselves and to others around us for misuse of it. We often hurt ourselves with it rather than using it with skillfulness. And how few even ordained ministers in our day know how to use the word of God appropriately. Throughout the land this day, I promise you that false ministers have used the word of God improperly, killing souls with it rather than bringing those who are dead to life. It is very easy to abuse the word of God. The devil himself did so. So we see that there is precedent for it. But the word of God is a weapon like no other. The word of God is a weapon like no other, living and powerful, piercing to the soul and feared by powers and principalities. It is fearsome to them. We have it. But what they manage to do to us is manage to convince us in our weakness not to go to the word of God. And doesn't this fall right into their agenda, into the agenda of sin, the world and the devil? Stay away from the word of God. You've got better things to do. You can always come to it later. It's so convenient, isn't it? How they have managed Indwelling sin in particular has managed to keep you away from the very thing that can destroy it. And so I think that is very interesting. Know your enemy, know yourself, and you will be able to fight this battle against sin. So your indwelling sin will pull you away from the means of grace because your old man, as we talked about this morning, fears it. It fears it. Um, This is something to remember. The old man is a part of you. It still is until you're glorified. And the old man fears the word of God, which is why you find yourself with a billion excuses to not go to the means of grace because it fears the the word of God. And men who fight in the armed forces, and we have many here who have done a wonderful service in our country's military, but men who fight in the armed services know that their life depends on the weapon that they use and knowing it well and knowing how to use it. Because they need to have exhaustive and intimate knowledge of their weaponry in order to defeat their enemy. That we would all be so diligent to know the word of God as military men know their weapons. It's not an easy thing to go through military training. I'm sure many will attest to that. But it is necessary to fight the battle. Well, why does this matter? You must know your enemy, know how to defeat it. And so the word of God will be important in that. And today we have one of those weapons before us in the book of James that gives us insight into fighting the battle that is all around us. And so let us turn there and look at verse 12 as James starts this teaching. He says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. First, James gives an encouragement to you from the word. God promises that you will receive a blessing if you endure the temptations and trials in this life and if you are found to be faithful to the end. And the blessing that he mentions here is the crown of life that is promised to those who love him. What is this crown? So many people have speculated as to the nature of these crowns. And it's not necessary, I think, to believe that this is a physical crown necessarily. But... What is important is to know you will be crowned with that great gift, life, life everlasting. And that's really the crown of life. Eternal life in communion with our God. There's nothing more you could ask for. It doesn't matter if it's ruby studded, if it's, if it's even a physical crown. So many people go into speculation and the weirdest things in the Christian world. But this is meant to be the crown of life. And you are to be crowned with it. And so it'll adorn you for all eternity. It is promised to those who love God, we see, and those who love God in Christ, because Jesus is your life. Jesus is your life. And so when you receive the crown of life, it is a signifier 
of the life given to you in Christ. He is the life. He is your life. He is the life of his people. And he is your great reward. And since this is the crown of life eternal, the word of God means here to do something based on the context of James that we've been in here so far. This is the imperishable crown which we receive, which will last forever, which is in contrast to the trials that we've talked about, the temptations that we've talked about, the day of sin that lays in you. It is for a short amount of time compared to the crown of life, compared to life everlasting. These temptations, these trials, they're insignificant in the grand scheme of things. And so look at the impermanence of it all. This is something that we are doing during our time here as a a pilgrim in this fallen world. But eternal life that, that looms before us forever, as you're crowned with that, keep your eye fixed on that prize is the exhortation of the word of God. Think of the permanence of this crown and the impermanence of trials. What does Paul call our afflictions? He calls them light and momentary. They may not feel that way to you now, but if you were to look at a chart of eternity and you think about your life here, you wouldn't even see your time of trial and temptation and affliction. They would be so insignificant, it would vanish in the chasm of eternity. And so they are light and momentary. Now, child of God, our Lord understands that you may not feel as if these temptations are light and momentary. They feel heavy and crushing when you are in the moment of temptation. There is agony. There is difficulty. It feels like it is way too much to bear. But the scripture encourages perseverance to keep your eye on the prize and the big picture. Life is difficult in certain ways more so when you are a believer. The forces of hell and sin truly are unleashed upon you as a believer because you have stepped from darkness into his marvelous light. And so now you are a target, something that the unbeliever doesn't have on their back. But every good soldier of Christ receives his reward, the crown of life to those who are loved by God. And as we saw this morning, James means to impress upon you, this crown is given to the lowly. It is given to the rich. This world does not crown the lowly. It only crowns the powerful. But this crown is given to both. And so is meant to be an encouragement to us that no matter what your station in life is right now, you will receive the crown of life and life eternal. Now, James tells you it is a sign of your love to God when you endure and persevere through, persevere through temptation. When you are found to persevere, you do so for the love of God and through the love of God. What higher motivation could he call you to to struggle with temptation? Natural man, by the way, has no such inclination. They may struggle with temptation because they have a selfish reason to. My wife will leave me if I do not give up my drunkenness. I will lose my children. I will lose my job if I do not get better and start showing up to work on time. Self-preservation. That is what the natural man wants. Self-preservation. But for the Christian, we mourn. I grieve my father in heaven. I have despised the blood of Christ. I took the spirit of God with me in my sin. How awful, how terrible these thoughts are to the regenerate heart. Natural man has no such motivation. He is not motivated by the love of God to flee temptation. How cold must the love of God be within us not to wrestle with the temptations that come upon us. It is love then that is that great motivator to flee temptation. And if you do love God, what is that a sign of? That he loved you first, isn't it? That is what the scripture says. So take comfort if your heart is warm towards God, if you love your God and you mourn over your sin. That is one of the surest signs of assurance to you that God loves you. No natural man can love God in Christ, none whatsoever. But if you love God, this is the encouragement. God loves you. And so never take that for granted. Never take that for granted. So if temptations come to you now, though, and you gladly succumb to them, you have no problem in fleeing to the temptation and not away from them. Well, then you must question whether the love of God rests on you if you do not wrestle with temptation and sin. So do not take the love of God for granted. Do not think to yourself, clearly God must love me if you don't wrestle 
with temptation, because that may very well not be the case. Do not grow cold towards God and hot towards temptation. And that's a dangerous place to be in. Now, notice I said struggle. I didn't say perfectly always defeat temptation and sin. So it's a struggle. It's a struggle. We will not always persevere perfectly. But there's the general character of our heart that we wish to fight against sin. And we are not gladdened by sin. And that is what we speak of this afternoon. Well, let's look at the source of temptation. Because this is important for us to understand. This is verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. James addresses a common complaint that man has against God. It is an old, old accusation that God is the one that tempts us to sin. It's as old as the garden itself. And uh, uh, our brother Andrew had been teaching us through some of some of what we will go over uh, over the past few weeks so we won't spend as much time in it but review a lot of the doctrine of predestination as we try to understand some very uh, basic truths about God and ourselves let us try to understand then why we are prone to blame God because in our corrupt and sinful estate we never want to blame ourselves for any sin that we commit That's just a basic truth. That's a basic anthropology of man in the fallen condition. Observe your children or observe our children here in the church. Uh, You will note that the last thing that they will want to do is blame themselves for their own behavior. Call out a child for their misdeeds. And what are you going to hear? You're going to hear things like this. But she did it first. It's not fair. He was making fun of me. No blame for themselves. Blame is always on others. Some adults, we suffer through this as well. It may be a little less obvious to others, but we do it as well. We constantly are blaming other people for our sins. And sadly, some Christians suffer from this, never seeing what has happened to them is due to their own action, their own sinful action. Much as it is easy to see in children, we must always ask ourselves whether we're doing the same thing. Because in our sinful estate, we are prone to blame others for our fall. And that ultimate deflection always winds up at the feet of God himself. Our ultimate deflection is to blame God, his providence, our station, something he has done for the reason that we fall into sin. And we can probably trace it back to where it all began in that Garden of Eden. You remember well what Adam said to God. As God confronted him with what he had done, Adam blamed the woman who God had given him. You see, it always travels back to God. It always is laid at God's feet. We are prone as people to blame God. And Adam, frankly, was the best of us, right? His faculties were not as clouded with sin as ours are this day. And so he was the prototypical human. And we follow in his footsteps, blaming everybody else but ourselves for what had happened. And ultimately, we blame God. But was it God who tempted them to sin? Was it God who tempted them? No, God tested them, which is very different. God tested them, but he did not tempt them. No, it was a testing. And the agent of that testing was the devil in the form of that serpent, wasn't he? You see, God would never do, this is important, God would never do what is morally repugnant to him. He would never lay sin before you and say, here, take and eat of sin. He never does that. That's repugnant to God, and he would never do such a thing. However, as we learned this afternoon, God will use secondary agents who are responsible for their desire for your sin. And I have on your sheet the Confession of Faith, uh, chapter 3 on God's decree, and uh, paragraph 1. And uh, we read from that in the Sabbath school hour, but I'll read for it, uh, it again for you. He, uh, the confession says, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. And the scripture proof comes from where? James one thirteen and one seventeen. our very passage this afternoon. 
Now, as we discussed, these are very difficult things to understand, child of God. And uh, I do not blame you if they're difficult to see how God's decree and our free will uh, work together. But uh, our brother did give us a very good explanation of that this afternoon. Ultimately, as was said, understanding this does rest on faith. It does rest on faith. You can try to wrap your mind around it, but I would suspect that many of us only have the slightest of understandings of how these pieces fit together. But that's okay because it is our arrogance that believes we can figure out how everything is accomplished by God. Sometimes we just need to take two statements in the scripture. The lot is cast, but every decision is from the Lord, and that God does not tempt anyone. And let it be at that. Let it be at that. We know the scripture cannot be broken, but our minds can be. That is something that we have to be aware of in humility, as we talked about humility this morning. The scripture cannot be broken, but our minds may be. Always have a mindset of humility when you approach the scripture. If scripture appears to contradict itself, be content to know that someone either much smarter than you or I has figured it out. And if they haven't, then God has worked it all out. It is sin and the limits of our intellect as creatures that have prevented us from grasping it. We're creatures after all. Even if sin didn't affect us, didn't afflict us, our understanding would be far lower than that of the creator. So it is a height of arrogance to think we can understand every working of God. A place for you to go to wrestle through these two things of uh, God as the uh, first cause and then the, the secondary agents is think of Christ being offered as a sacrifice. It was a good thing, wasn't it? Christ being offered as a sacrifice. Yes. However, it could only happen through the will of evil men. As no righteous man would have ever crucified Christ. You couldn't find a righteous man to do such a deed. Only a wicked man could have done it. And God used a wicked man to do it. Wicked men to do it. Do you ever think that God wanted to crucify Christ? That was God's desire. Doesn't it pain you to even think about that? But it was God's desire to crucify Christ. But was his desire for evil? No, it was for your salvation. Was the desire of the wicked for your salvation? No, the wicked's desire was not for your salvation. It was to stamp out the seed of the woman. That is why the wicked did what they did. Yet God uses that wickedness to save his people. Notice that he uses the same wicked act then to also condemn the very people who committed it. How beautiful is God's wisdom. He uses the wickedness of evil men to accomplish salvation on one hand and also to condemn them on the other as they receive their just reward. How beautiful is God's mind and understand if we don't understand it as we ought to, it is a limitation of our own nature. Salvation and judgment, two sides of the same coin. So God's motives are always good, but he will use the wicked to accomplish his will. It's the same for you and I. While God does not tempt us with evil, he uses secondary causes to do so. And that temptation is meant to be a testing for our good, not our destruction, if you are a child of God. You see, Adam and Eve were tested in that garden, seeing if they would pass the terms of the covenant of works, if they would pledge themselves to God or declare their independence from him that day. Remarkably, not only does God not tempt us with evil, We are told that he has given us every benefit in the time of temptation. We are told that in the time of testing, he has actually stacked things in your favor. That's what we don't understand. We want to blame him, but he says he has stacked things in our favor. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. We also are prone to throw a pity party. Why are you tempting me in such a way? Nobody else is being tempted. But it is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. There is a constraint there based on what you are able to do in Christ. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You see, God has actually stacked things in your favor. And we believe the same was true in the garden. We'll speak about that in a bit. But Adam had every benefit going for him. A belly full, a companion who was there besides him to help him. He had the word of God. He had everything he needed. There's nothing Adam can blame God for, even though he tries. God has stacked things in his favor. So never blame God. To the contrary, God should be praised because with the temptations, he always gives you a way of escape. 
and gives you his spirit as a source of power and strength in the time of the trial. He has given you the word of God that you may bring it to your remembrance. Further demonstrating God's righteousness, James tells us that our temptations arise because of our own lusts. Our own lusts. Think of that. You see, God's testing of us exposes to us our lusts, or it should. When we are tempted, we are then given an opportunity to see what we lust for. That is what God is doing. We see our lusts. It exposes our lusts. And our lusts belong to ourselves and are part of that sinful nature that must be mortified and put to death. You see, the devil would have nothing to work with if Eve did not desire that fruit. The devil would have had nothing to work with if Eve did not desire the forbidden fruit for herself. Do you remember what the devil didn't do in the garden? Did he force Eve to take a bite? Did he put her face up to the fruit and say, eat so you will die? No, he did something very subtle, and this is what temptation does. The devil inflamed her own desires for the fruit and used that to draw her to death. For instance, you could hardly tempt most children with broccoli, could you? Because most children have no desire for it. However, candy, on the other hand, you could tempt them to all sorts of evil with candy, but not with broccoli, because there's no desire there for it. So temptations draw their strength from our own lusts. And that's something that we need to be aware of. Temptations draw their strength from our own lust. The verse here tells us that our desires draw us away by being enticing. Enticing. The language in the Greek is actually quite remarkable. It carries with it the sense that you are, by force, being carried away by the enticements of your lust. You're being carried off, as it were, by your enticements. The imagery is like that of the harlot who uses her charms to seduce you, but then carries you off to your death. That's the kind of imagery that we have here. Think of the warnings in the Proverbs about the harlot. Think about Proverbs 6.26, where the adulteress is said to pray upon your precious life. That is the picture here. Uh, For those who are familiar with Greek mythology, you remember the siren call, the call of the sirens? a kind of beautiful sound that you are entranced by. You're compelled to go towards, but at the end, the voice that casts it is there for your death and destruction. That is what we are seeing here in the book of James. This is what temptation is like with our natural lusts. See the kind of foe you are up against. Do not make peace with it. See the power of it in your own sinful nature. Uh, John Owen says this, When a man sees his lust as a trivial thing, it is an indication that he is not mortified. We cannot go forward unless we recognize the danger of our own hearts. Always be aware of the danger of your own hearts. You go to bed every night. You're awake every day with your own worst enemy right there with you. Be aware that it dwells within you. But this is what makes Jesus such a marvelous savior. You see, Jesus has no lust for sin, but we do. Jesus has no lust for sin, but we do. So when Jesus was tested by being led by the Spirit into that wilderness, he was was proven to be worthy to be the Savior of man, the second Adam triumphant, because sin had no hold on him. The devil had nothing to grab a purchase of in Jesus' soul. He grasped and he grasped and he grasped and used that old playbook of trying to entice him with the best lusts that he knew how. And yet there was nothing for the devil to grab a hold of in Jesus' soul. Jesus was pure, godly, holy. There was no lust in him for ungodliness that the devil could use. And so when you look at the temptation of the Christ, look at it from that framework. He draws Jesus' thoughts to all the great things the world has to offer power, fortune, even to feed his belly. But Jesus had no lust in him that the devil could grab a hold of. And for the first time in all of human history, the devil found someone who had no lust for sin and could do nothing with that. And that is remarkable. And a difference between the Savior and all other specimens of man. Praise Jesus for it. And verse 15 then goes to that chain of death, desire, sin, and death. Verse 15 says, And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, 
brings forth death. If Paul tells us that the wages of sin are death in Romans 3, then James is going to show us how that death unfolds by way of this chain that leads to spiritual death. James's illustration here is graphic and it is powerful. He likens sin in us as a parasitic organism that is conceived within us. And when it grows to maturity in the host, it bursts out, killing the very host in which it was conceived. God gives us illustrations of creatures like this in nature, I think, to demonstrate the ugliness of indwelling sin and what it does to us. Um, This is what you're up against, child of God. This is not pretty. This is not sterile. This is not clinical. This is ugly. This is the enemy that is within us. Indwelling sin is called indwelling sin because it lives within you. Its desire is for you. And if you nurture it, it will be killing you. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. That is the nature of the battle and the war that we face. These are not things to be taken lightly. We cannot treat sin as if it can be toyed with, as if we can control it on our own. And the first step here, James speaks of, is when our desires entice us. And this is where temptation has its power. Our desires. Inside of us, we have desires for all manner of unholy things. And these desires must be mortified. They must be mortified. And remember these desires. We must know, first of all, what they are. Have you taken an inventory of what you know of your desires that lead to sin? You know what they are. Deep down, you know what they are, even if you haven't admitted them to yourself. Go to God in prayer. Ask him to reveal them to you. Root them out. Expose them to the light of the word. Do not let them scurry back into the darkness at the edge of your consciousness where you hide them until they burst out at the worst possible moment. Expose those things that drag you under to the light of the word of God. Bring them before God in prayer and confession. Plead for his help to mortify these lusts and desires that you have. How often do we take those things that we struggle with and bring them to prayer and maybe even fasting as our Lord fasted? Take stock of your spiritual condition and bring it before God. Watch and pray for temptation as our Lord exhorted us. Never figure that you're going to be able to deal with temptation in the moment. Never do that. Our Lord tells us in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. Remember that as a general rule. The spirit is eager to mortify sin. The spirit is eager to take you out of temptation. But it's our flesh that is at fault. Our flesh is weak. And so we must be prepared for the day of temptation. Brother and sister, Satan's power is far greater than your own, but he is no match for the Spirit of God. He is no match for the Spirit of God. Your indwelling sin is powerful, but it's no match for the Spirit of God. And that's what God tells us here. Remember, go before the temptation arises to God in prayer, knowing specifically what you are tempted to each day. Maybe this is something for you to do at the end of your day. Remember those things that you were tempted with that day and that you did sin and fall into. Or maybe you, by God's grace, did persevere through and avoid it. But bring those things in continually and be watchful for them. I think if we admitted it to ourselves, we know we fall into the same patterns every day. We're creatures of habit for the most part. So these things are actually are, are, are shockingly easy to bring before God in prayer if we examine our heart for them. Owen says, rise mightily against the first actings of thy distemper, its first conception. Suffer it not to take the least ground. Do not say, thus far it shall go and no farther. If it have allowance for one step, it will take another. It is impossible to fix bounds to sin. It is like water in a channel. If it once break out, it will have its course. It's a good thing to remember. Don't let sin take even the least step in your day. Children, you might remember that imagery of Gandalf, right? Telling the Balrog, you cannot pass. Or as the movie butchered, you shall not pass. But anyway, this is the kind of thing that you are to do with temptation. Do not allow it to progress and let sin creep in. It will run its course if you do. You must always be on guard. Do not allow it to take the first step. 
And one of the things that many divines have warned us about is that uh, one of the things that weakens us in our fight against temptation is the pursuit of pleasure. Not pleasure in of itself, but the pursuit of pleasure. Be very clear there on that warning. The pursuit of pleasure. Thomas Manton points out that the pursuit of pleasure in this life is dangerous. Not necessarily enjoying the good things of life that our Lord gives us, but the pursuit of it. The pursuit of pleasure is a marker that something not right has gotten a hold of your soul. And in our day and age, our entire culture is saturated with the pursuit of pleasure. In fact, that seems to be man's chief end, according to our current culture. The pursuit of pleasure and the embracing of myself. So our entire culture pursues pleasure, and it's always a danger, no matter what culture a Christian is in, that they will take on aspects of that culture. So now we need, we need to be on guard that we don't allow ourselves to pursue pleasure inordinately. Because when it's, you start to pursue it, pleasures start to fill your thoughts, and that's when there is danger. We are always told to approach pleasure with a measure of self-control and mastery over it. Remember... One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Thomas Manton warns of this danger using Proverbs 23.31. I'll read the proverb to you. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You see, when we start, again, wine is one of those Beautiful things that the Lord has given for our enjoyment in this world. But it's the pursuit. When your mind is full of when I'm going to take my next uh, uh, drink. When I, throughout the day, I'm consumed with thoughts of these pleasures. That's when now we know something has grabbed a hold of us. Something has grabbed a hold of us. And on this proverb, Matthew Henry states, Be not ruled by sense, but reason and religion. Be not ruled by sense, but reason and religion. Two things, by the way, that the world hates, reason and religion. Remember Eve, when she saw the forbidden fruit, she said it was desirous to her senses, overshadowing her religion and reason. The pursuit of pleasure then is one of the ways in which our religion is overshadowed by the senses. Very recently, sad to say, a prominent reform minister was arrested for drunk driving with his children in the car. So do not think that you cannot fall into sin. This man is probably more godly than I am. The moment we start to think, why couldn't he get his act together or somebody else, is the moment that we start to have spiritual danger. When you start to think, I would never do such a thing, that's when there's danger brethren. So let us never allow the pursuit of pleasure to overshadow our senses. That's when we start to see lusts then that temptations can grab a hold of and pull us down with. You see, we need to mortify these things. And don't limit this, of course, to alcohol. Alcohol is just a commonly used device in the scriptures. It's a device used in the scripture to discuss the perils of the pursuit of pleasure. There's a general moral principle here that goes for all lawful pleasures in life. Alcohol, movies, the internet, whatever it is. Um, there is a general prohibition against the pursuit of pleasure. Enjoy the pleasures of life in moderation. Keeping in mind always, though, there is always that line that leads to sin. You know, there's lots of good uses for the internet. I use it for research all the time. But at some point, I know there is a line that will draw me to sin if I use it in a certain way. Um, there is always a line. And... Um, particularly for some who are tempted with various kinds of temptations. The men know what I'm talking about. Those types of folks who struggle with that particular temptation need to know where that line is and know that the lawful use can drift very easily into an unlawful use very quickly. Know where that line is. And if you must, we'll speak of this. Jesus says, cut off your limbs if it causes you to sin. Cut off things that cause you to sin. It's not a, a gentle exhortation in the scripture. It's very emphatic. Something causes you to sin, even if it's as precious as your body parts. Cut it off. But we're not willing to do that. We'll talk about this for a moment, a moment later. A good diagnosis tool I have found for the inordinate seeking of pleasure comes from the Sabbath day. Comes from the Sabbath day. One of the things that grieves me about is sometimes Sabbath day conversations that even Sabbatarians engage in. You know, you know that the pursuit of pleasure 
has come over you, that these lusts are in you, if on the Lord's day we cannot fill our thoughts full of God and good Christian fellowship without it going into the pleasures of this world and how, what we're going to do next week to do this and that, and I'm going to enjoy this and I'm going to enjoy that. Well, those things, those things are fine to do. But on the Sabbath day, if your thoughts are consumed with them, then that's where the problem lies, that our problem is. And this is what a wonderful tool the Lord has given us, a day of rest where we may be able to find this list of things we need to mortify in our life. Whatever grieves you on the Sabbath day, as far as things that you have difficulty leaving behind in the world, take that to God. It's to your benefit that you know those things. Take them to God. So much of the church is consumed, even the Reformed church is consumed with things that pass away. The Sabbath day exposes it. Thomas Manton says once more, learn to suspect things that are too delightful, that are too delightful. Carnal objects tickle much and beget an evil delight, and so fasten upon the soul. It is time to put a knife to the throat when you begin to be tickled with the sweets of this world. You see that imagery that our forefathers would use? It's very graphic. Learn to suspect those things that latch onto you or fasten onto your soul, have their hooks in you. Put a knife to the throat. This is not, you know, if, if a Christian is called to violence of any kind, this is against sin. That is the kind of violence you are called to. That's the violence you're called to. Use your violent nature against sin and not against the brethren. So when temptation does come, you are at a crossroads. The temptation itself is not sin. But if we don't flee from it and turn to God, then we fall into sin. At this point, then, you are to remember that promise that God has given in 1 Corinthians 10 that he has given you the strength by the Spirit to withstand it, and he has given you a means of escape if you would just look for it. That's what we are to remember when the time of temptation comes. But if you do fall into temptation and yield to it, it will birth sin, which will bring forth in you great spiritual damage. While we know that the one in Christ will never spiritually die, the damage done can be significant. The damage done can be very significant. See, Remember the preaching that our pastor did in the life of David. David was always loved by God, never had to worry that God would forsake him. However, think of the consequences that his many sins had on his own life and the life of the kingdom of God and his own family. You see, there's great spiritual damage that is done, even though God will save us. We know that God loves us and cares for us and will bring us through it. There will be great spiritual damage. It's almost like you think about uh, um, when you're suffering from a disease that eats at your flesh. It's a, it's a a nasty thing that causes you to stink sort of, that's why the the scriptures always use uh, leprosy as a picture of sin. This is what sin is. It's not pretty. God doesn't use the delightful things in the world to signify sin. He uses leprosy about the most awful thing that can happen to your body to signify it. Well, In uh, the garden, we have an illustration of it. Our time is getting away from us. So what I'll do is I'm just going to bring it to your remembrance. um, And remember how quickly everything happens in the garden. Remember how quickly all things happened in that garden. The serpent comes. He entices her with her lusts for the fruit. And then she falls into sin. And so is all of mankind as they took that fruit and ate. So don't think then that you will have plenty of time to consider the temptation when it comes. Your lusts are that part that are not reasonable. I use that in the old language. It's not reasonable to you, but your desires are for your lusts. And so lust will overcome your reason. Don't think you'll be able to sit there reasoning and having a discourse between yourself and God in the time when it happens that you'll be using your reason for that. You see, this is why Jesus says to watch and be prayerful before the time of temptation. The mortification must be done ahead of time. And watch for this pattern in your life. Mortify sins before temptation, because when the temptation comes, I think you know you're usually at a low point, spiritually speaking. Your defenses are usually down. The lust overcomes you very easily. But what we do is we prepare beforehand. We prepare beforehand. And so what should they have done in that garden? Uh, Instead of listening to the serpent, Well, they should have spoken the word of God with authority to it. Why do we say this is what they should have done? Well, this is what Jesus did, is it not? 
Isn't this what the Savior did? And if we know anything about the Savior, what he does is what we should have been doing. And so when the Savior speaks the word of God to that serpent, that is what Adam and Eve should have done. Said, you will go no farther. God himself has said, we will not eat of this fruit. We love God. We obey God. And we will obey the voice of our God. Be gone. That is what they should have done to that serpent. And see, because they did not do that, and we would not do that, God sent his only begotten son who would do everything that the first Adam did not do. Because of the ruin of mankind in our sinful estate, we need a savior. One who can be tested and never be found to fail. The kind of man we should be, but we are not. So out of love to us, the Redeemer of God's elect, the Christ came to be our salvation. And our hope this day is not found in resisting temptation perfectly that we would never sin. We resist temptation because we love God and out of new hearts we desire to do good and not evil. But our hope, our hope is found only in Christ and his righteousness. Remember that when Adam was tempted in a garden with a belly full and a helper comparable to him, Christ was sent into a wilderness hungry with no one to help him. This is our Savior. The difficulties the Savior undertook to undo what Adam did were far greater than what Adam had to go through for you and for me. And he was victorious. He overcame the devil with the proper use of the word of God so that you may be saved today. The more you see and understand the Savior's work, the more that Christ must be glorified in you. And you must become, he must become so glorious to you that he becomes your desire and you want to imitate him. And out of love to God, you say, I see the God man in the scriptures. No one compares to him. I love him. He suffered much for me. He did much to suffer for my salvation. And I wish to be like him. I wish to be like the Savior. And so God, by your spirit, make me like your beloved son so that I may glorify him. As we saw the motivation of Agur this morning in Proverbs 30, that we would bring glory to the name of God in our uh, times of temptation and avoiding them, that we would never blaspheme the name of God. Make sure that your motivation for enduring temptation is not one of self-preservation. Don't think, because I don't want my family to turn out poorly, I'm going to need your help, God, to stay away from temptation. Say, because I want to glorify you, God, I want your name to be glorified as men look to me and ask, where do you find the sure hope to avoid evil? In God Almighty, who gives me his son to save me of my wickedness. Well, today we have seen how temptation births sin, which leads to death. It's an ugly chain that is full of misery, and there could be an easily a sermon series on this one point. But you have been given resources to, get, uh, to aid you in your fight against sin, the means of grace. Spiritual disciplines like uh, devotions with the word of God, family worship, even fasting, as we talked about, would be wholly inappropriate when seeking God's favor in dealing with our sins. And before you do come to worship, ask that God's special blessing would be upon the means of grace that you receive. Don't come to worship without acknowledgement to God of your sin. We confess our sins corporally. It's just wonderful. Confess your sins particularly to him before you come to him and say, God, through the means of grace this day, strengthen me that I may sin no more in these ways. This is what we do before we come as part of our preparation. So James told us last time we remember, James says we do not receive because we do not ask. We do not receive because we do not ask. Ask how often we have asked God that he would mortify sin in our life and make a preparation for the Lord's day. Know yourself, know your enemy, a key principle in your fight against sin. And as we said, one of Jesus' hard sayings is, if any sin causes you to sin, uh, if there anything causes you to sin, cut it off. Cut it off. He used the most important parts of us in that illustration, our eye, our hand. Child of God, you can cut off the computer if it causes you to sin. You can cut off the liquor or whatever it is that causes you to sin. You can cut off the television programs, the going to a particular place, a relationship, if it's a relationship, a particular television show, whatever it is that causes you to sin. It's no small thing to cut off anything like that. And so God says, cut off anything that causes you to sin. 
And uh, brethren, God will honor you for this. And part of the problems we have is that when it's a time to make a choice for holiness, we become practical atheists. Practical atheists. We don't know that God says he will honor those who honor him. Make that part of your motivation. Remember, your weapons are mighty in God. 2 Corinthians 10.4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. And so remember that that is why your natural man doesn't want you to seek the means of grace. It's the very thing of their undoing, of your indwelling sin's undoing. And so, of course, where's the last thing the enemy wants you to go? To the word of God and the means of grace. Remember that. Remember your enemy. Remember yourself. And finally, be encouraged that Christ has done the work of salvation. And when we fail in the temptations of life, we are saved not because we are successful, but because he was. And remember the encouragement of the word we received today. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Christ received that crown because he was worthy and he grants it to you out of the riches of his mercy. Receive that crown from Christ and live. Amen.